Revelation 16 and verse 13, please. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. And we know the Lord will bless that reading of his word in public. Bless us by in a word of prayer. Father, we ask you now in Jesus' name that you'd settle our hearts in this congregation and that everyone that's in this house and under this roof, male and female, young and old, we pray, Lord, that you would minister to them and teach us of your ways and the plans and the purposes of God for our individual lives and for our nations. And that the name of the Lord Jesus would be abundantly lifted up, magnified and glorified. For we ask it all for his glory and for his name's sake. Amen. Last week we looked at the sixth vial, uh, the sixth angel pouring out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And we've shown you an awful lot about that. Let me give you a brief rundown, though. This vial that is poured out, notice it's the sixth one, and we'll come back to it in a moment. And we showed you at this point in time how when this vial is poured out, it brings us right up to date. And there are those who are classed, are known in theological terms as futurists, who say, this is all to come. And there'll be real living, flying things about, or like uh, with whipping tails and so on. But really, in the historic interpretation of prophecy, you find that all this is a progression throughout history and God revealing to his people what is and has been happening. Notice this, though. I want you to take a close mark and really mark your Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 21, please. Luke chapter 21. The Lord Jesus is the speaker. Let your eye run down to verse 24. Speaking of the people of Jerusalem, he says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now notice that. We touched on it last week. And the times of the Gentiles are found in Bible prophecy. The times of the Gentiles are the seven times punishment of Israel. Now let's look at it. I didn't uh, explain it the way I could have in a deeper way this evening, just to give you a better idea. First of all, when we look at the seven times punishment, we have to look at how the Lord had said that if Israel walk contrary unto him, he would walk contrary unto them. And so because they brought false idols and false gods into their nation, this is when Israel had separated themselves into two kingdoms, the house of Israel in the north, the house of Judah in the south. And of course, the house of Israel in the north, they first fell into idolatry and spiritual adultery. And when they fell into that, God, after sending prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Amos, among others, 
when he sends them, we find that in, this, in the history that God had taken the prophets and withdrew them out of the road and brought in a divine judgment of wrath upon, first of all, the northern kingdom, the house of Israel. I'll show you one of the timelines, if I may, in a moment. And of course, we looked at it how when the northern kingdom were taken away in 745 B.C., remember B.C., that seven times punishment comes from when the Lord says, I'll punish you seven times more for your sins in Leviticus chapter 26. Okay, the Lord says, and if you will not, for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Notice that. So seven times. How do we get seven times? Last week I threw it out as though we all would know. So forgive me because I've brought it that many times. A lot of you have learned it. Let me show you how we get to the years 2520. A day for a year in Scripture is the, the, the line or the, it's the benchmark for Bible prophecy. So Israel, the northern kingdom, would be carried away captive from 745 B.C. Being carried away captive, we have to work out how we get 2,520 years to make up the seven times punishment, okay? So let's look at it like this. The Lord said in Numbers 14, and he also said again in Ezekiel chapter 4, that he would give a day for a year, a day for a year, okay? And so a day for a year was when they sent the spies into number 14. They spy out the land of Canaan, and of course they were there 40 days, and that was to mark the 40, year, uh, 40 years that they would then walk around as, uh, the wilderness because they were afraid to go in and take Canaan land. So the Lord said it would be a day for a year. Ezekiel is told to lie on one side, my memory casting back right, it's 390 days for the punishment of the house of Israel. Now, you think people are strange today. Can you imagine if God told you to go and lie naked in the street for 390 days on one side? You might get a few bed sores laying on the ground at that time. But here the Lord says, I'll give you a day for a year. So he sets it down in Ezekiel 4. Then the other side was for the house of Judah, the two houses of Israel. Now, moving on. So how do we get that? A day for a year, seven times, okay? One time is 360. In other words, if we have a circle, if we have a circle, it's 360 degrees. Go around the Earth's equator, it's a circle 360 degrees. In fact, you can measure it out, measure it out and it's uh, 12 lunar cycles. 12 times the moon goes around the Earth, and while it's going around, the moon's going around the earth, that's one month, two months, three months, 12 months. And by the time 12 months are up, the earth has went around the sun one time. Pretty basic, isn't it? But the two time scales are different. But when they're brought into an average, it's 360. Okay, so 360 is one revolution, one turning. Seven times, seven times 360 brings us to 2,520. Yes, is not right? 2,520. Starting to get myself mixed up now. Okay, so the Lord in 745 BC, he carries away the house of Israel, okay? And they then become lost to themselves. They get lost to who they are. They're falling away from God. And that's the first deportment of the three eastern tribes, uh, Reuben, and, Reuben and God and East Manasseh over Jordan. And from that date, the seven times punishment in the house of Israel started. And so they're carried into Assyria, and then they migrate westward into, as I said, Greece, Italy, Spain, and so on. Paul desired to go to Zaragoza in Spain in one of his letters because of that. And of course, into Scandinavia, into Saxony and Germany, over into Holland, and then, of course, into our own islands here in Great Britain. And many of us then we see ourselves in the lineal descent of that. Okay, so when we're looking at this, we see that carrying away. And that finishes then a little later on because after they populated here, where did we populate? Went west of the United States of America. The seven times punishment of the house of Israel is still happening. It's still in effect. So let's do our maths. Seven times 360, 2,520, which is 2,520 years because it's a day for a year. So when we take 
to 745 BC, and we bring it right up, and one for crossing from BC to AD, and then carry on the 2520 years, we come to the year 1776 AD. That is the year where the American Declaration of Independence was signed. And you can see the picture of the artist's interpretation of it there. 13 eastern seaboard colonies of the United States withdrew from Britain. They lost this baby, and God gave them others. The Industrial Revolution came. And then when the rest or the fall of Samaria happened, we find that the, uh, the, the, the seven times punishment finishes in the year 1801. What happened in the year 1801? That's when the Union of Great Britain and Ireland was formed. And of course, that's when your Union flag, the Union Jack, was formed also. That flag, many may call it the butcher's apron. And I know there were many atrocities and terrible things done, but that was the flag that took the gospel. That was the flag that took the nation around the world. That was the flag that brought people to South Africa and to Africa or to Australia and to New Zealand and to Canada and so on. And it was that flag that was flying on the ships that brought people around the world and conquered the very world, as it were, in order to bring the gospel message. In other words, the gospel came as they conquered. So here we have the finishing of that time. Then we have the southern kingdom in the house of Judah. 604. I'm doing this from memory, so you can forgive me. 604 BC, we can see the fall of Jerusalem. And Nebuchadnezzar came and took them all the way into Assyria, 604 BC, plus you do the one for a, from BC to AD. You do your seven times punishment, 2,520 years, and it brings us to the year 1917 AD. 1917 AD. Now, turn to Revelation 16 and keep yourself there. Keep your finger here in Luke's Gospel 21. We're just going to flick back. I want you to see something here. Revelation 16, please. And verse... Revelation 16 and verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates... And the water thereof was dried up, and the ways of the kings of the east might be prepared. Here again we can see, as we showed you last week, and moving briefly because we have so much to get into tonight. The river Euphrates was not the, the, is not the literal river. For why would we need to dry up a literal river in modern technology? The Turkish Ottoman Empire had conquered right around that river. Peoples that were populated there right down as far as India, right over and into Jerusalem. And the, the whole empire of the Ottoman Empire were, were Islamic. We're still there in 1917 when British General Jalan Allenby, you see God's wisdom and plan as he raises up Britain as, a, as a, a nation and a company of nations or a commonwealth of nations as prophesied unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He raises them up. He raises America up as a great nation as prophesied. And he says, I'll raise these Christian nations up. And I notice this, they were used to liberate, or Britain was used and the Commonwealth to liberate Jerusalem from Turkish Islamic Ottoman power in 1917, sending over the little two by wing planes. There's Allenby. You can see them there going in the Jaffa Gate. They conquered on the 8th of December 1917, and that was the year uh, Judah's punishment finished. Seven times punishment. They conquered in the year 1917, or they flew over, and the Turks, they just dropped everything and came out without a shot being fired, without a bomb being dropped. And of course, when we look at that then, this picture shows us Allenby walking in the Jaffa Gate in Jerusalem in the 9th of December, 1917. And we showed you the, the coin that was struck up, showing also the Islamic year of 1335, as uh, prophesied in Daniel chapter 12, on verse 12. You can, you can look that on. I haven't time to go into it all. So what does this all mean for now? This shows us that almost 100 years ago, all but two years, this sixth vial has been poured out upon the Euphrates. The waters dried up. The Ottoman Empire lost their empire. The Ottoman Empire are the Turkish people. 
And of course, Allenby came in, Jerusalem was liberated, the seven times punishment of the southern kingdom of Judah had been finished. And from then, we've seen the rise, though, of the Bolshevik Revolution and communism. We've seen Mao Zedong uh, taking the Marxist ideology and communism into China, starting the China People's Communist Revolution. The Chinese nationalists going to Taiwan, and that's where you get the fighting with Taiwan at the minute, with America backing Taiwan. So you can see all this plan coming to pass. And then, of course, we also seen the lion visions of Fatima, the three uh, Roman Catholic shepherd children being told a so-called uh, vision of Mary saying to consecrate Russia to my immaculate heart. We've seen then the growth of the European Union being formed. And we've seen the blue army or the word apostolate of, of Fatima growing with their blue flag. And it was taken and added on to be the flag of the European Union. That was all last week. But that's where we are, bringing us right up to date. And of course, if you read into Revelation chapter 22, it gives you the picture of what happens around this time whenever Babylon the Great uh, is fallen, is fallen. There's mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the whole earth. You'll see this woman riding the beast. Okay, go back to Luke 21, please, just briefly. Look at what it says about what will happen. Verse 25, and there shall be signs there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth and distress of nations with perplexity. The, the word perplexity simply means there'll be no way out. Now you look at our nations tonight, you look at our world, and you tell me, are we at that time when no one knows what to do and there's no way out? It gives the idea of going up a cul-de-sac and there's no through road. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, Men's hearts feeling them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now you're told that you'll not see anything, it will just disappear. But here it says we'll see the Son of Man coming. Notice this. Let's see what he says. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Now Jesus pauses here and gives us a sign of the times. And it's in verse 29. And he spake unto them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know you of your own selves that summer is now at hand. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know ye, that the kingdom of God is at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The fig tree is a symbol in Scripture of the Jews. The fig tree is a symbol in Scripture of Jewry, J-E-W-R-Y. The vine was the symbol of the house of Israel. Joseph is a fruitful branch or a fruitful vine. And Joseph was a name for the house of Israel, whose branches have run over the wall, over the wall of the Holy Land, as we call it. Over the wall to where? I'm only after telling you. Right over the wall and right through Europe to the West. Listen, when the Apostle Paul was going to preach the gospel in the book of Acts, the Holy Ghost forbade him to go to the East. Why? Because Israel went West. And he told them to go that direction, the scattering of the seed of the kingdom. Now, I notice this also. The Lord says that the fig tree, behold the fig tree and all the trees. He says there's going to be other nations rising up. There's going to be an upheaval. There's going to be a change in names. There's going to be a change in nations. He says, and when you see the fig tree coming, he says, now you know you're getting close to my coming. The fig tree is a symbol of the Israeli state that's in Palestine or the Holy Land tonight. And he says, when you see it, in other words, he says, it'll shoot forth leaves. Now, notice leaves, not fruit. Isn't that strange? In other words, it'll look the part, and everyone will flock to it. He says, but as for Jesus is concerned, they still reject me. Christ has gone in to Jerusalem on his way before his crucifixion, that final week, and he sees a fig tree, and he goes to it to see if there's fruit thereon, finds no fruit thereon, but plenty of foliage, plenty of leaves that looks the part, and he curses the fig tree. 
The next day when they're going in the back to Jerusalem, Peter sees and says, Behold, master, the fig tree which thou cursest. And he sees this great big tree is withered up. And this was a sign of the Jews of his day who rejected Jesus and says, We will not have this man to reign over us as our king. And that was a symbol, he says, Well, then this nation will be decimated. And in AD 70, Titus the Roman prince came and he decimated he killed, some say, crucified 100,000 Jews around the walls of Jerusalem. Carried away and captive, and many, or some say, was up to a million displaced at that time. So you can see where Jesus now looks again at the fig tree. He says, when you see it coming, he says, you know that I am at the doors. So notice what happens. 1917, at the end of Judah, or Judah's where you get the name Jew from, at the end of the seven times punishment, Jerusalem is liberated. Within 30 years, the fig tree starts to grow. In 1948, they had a status of their own nation, and the fig tree starts to grow. And what happens? It becomes the blue touch paper. It becomes the powder keg of the Middle East, because there is where Armageddon will start. You mark my words, because this is what the Bible is telling us. Look at Revelation chapter 16 again, please. Time is flying. Revelation 16. So we looked last week, these three unclean spirits like frogs, or the mouth, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, we identified them as Rome riding the beast of Europe, ecumenism. We identified the false prophet as Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And we also identified uh, the, the dragon that was communism. Uh, uh, the base was Europe, okay? So we have communism and all the humanistic, socialistic avenues that come from that. Now, notice this. Verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. In Bible numerology, six is the number of man. Man was created, created on the sixth day. Men were appointed six days to labor, the seventh to rest. An Hebrew slave, now notice in Hebrew slave, not any slave, but an Hebrew slave was to serve six years and be released from their servitude. Say they had great debts and couldn't pay it. They had to become a slave laborer for six years and then that would pay their debts. They were free in the seventh year. Six years a man was to sow and reap in the harvest in the field. Then let the field rest on the seventh year also. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18 mentions the number six also when he multiplied. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the numbers of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. In other words, we know it as six, six, six. Notice it's the number. The beast's number is the number of a man. I know that. It's the number of a man. The beast represents the system of governance by mankind which has invaded, invaded the earth. The best that man can produce from a sinful, depraved heart that's without God and under constant influence of his chief advisory, who is Satan himself. Now note this. Satan plies and tempts sinful minds and frail flesh and despicable morality even the like of Stephen Fry, a man who was arrested in his youth, who's married a some young boy like uh, a homosexual, who's living in a vile lifestyle, who shakes his fist at God and spits towards heaven and has an audacity to stand and say that God is immoral. That's man's moral when it's plied by the wiles of the devil. All of these are now prevalent in our nation. Man's system on earth is made up of three parts. That is, his satanic inspired three parts. One, economics. Two, religious. And three, governmental. Okay? Economics, religious, and governmental. Revelation 16, verse 13 speaks of three unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophets. First, 14 tells us, for they are the spirits of devils. 
So everything you're seeing now, even with the like of Mr. Fry, it's the spirit of devils working upon this. When you see gay pride parades and you're seeing them half naked, romping with each other in their violence in the streets, that is the spirit of devils. And it's nothing short of it, brothers and sisters. This is the spirit of devils. When you see the debauchery and the sin that's going on in our land, when you see the wickedness of man's heart, that is the spirit of devils. The number six relates to 6,000 years we have from Father Adam, Adam's race. And 6,000 years brings us right to this date. And the seventh is when Christ returns in the clouds with great power and glory. And that is his millennial kingdom age and reign. Revelation 16 and verse 17 brings us right up to date. So here we have the fig tree now. Remember the kings of the east are China coming. We spoke about that in the communism. The fig tree comes in 1948. The nations are gathering against it. And it has, it, it has also, uh, remember there are Jews who are not, who say there are Jews, and we, I know they're blasphemy, but are the synagogue of Satan. So we have to differentiate who are real and who are not here. Then this brings us right into Revelation 16 and 17. Notice this. We're told that the angel poured out his vial into the air. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne saying, notice, it is done. The seventh vial from the seventh angel, it is done. The number seven in the Bible is mentioned 735 times. 54 times in the book of Revelation alone. And counting the words seventh fold, which is mentioned six times, and seventh, which is mentioned 119 times, so it references to the number seven 860 times in our Bible. Seven is the number of completeness and perfection, both physical and spiritual. There are seven days, for example, in one week. God's rest from creation was on the seventh day. Israel's Sabbath given to them was the seventh day. There are seven churches in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, speaking of seven prophetical church ages, bringing us right till today. So number seven shows a completeness. The seventh church age is the Laodicean age, which makes Jesus sick in Revelation chapter 3 before his coming. And that's when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. That means what Christ says, I am here wanting to fellowship with my church. And he's saying, this is the last church before I return. You're sitting in it tonight. I don't mean Donna Clonelum now. I'm speaking about the age we're sitting in that age tonight. Notice this. In the Bible, there are seven seals, seven plagues, seven thunders, and seven trumpets, all in the book of Revelation. The first resurrection of the dead takes place at the seventh trumpet. And notice this, it completes God's full and free salvation and redemption for his saints. There are seven holy days or seven feasts, seven what they call moadim in the Hebrew. And the moadim are seven appointed times to sit in feast days for Israel. Notice this. First of all, and I'll not go through these, these are a different study. First of all, it starts with the feast of Passover. Passover was when they slayed the lamb and shed its blood. And Christ, our Passover, is killed for us. He's slain for us. So it represents our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Then there is the feast of unleavened bread. The unleavened bread is when they swept out unleavened leaven bread or leaven from all their houses. Uh, and they made sure that their house was clean of it because it speaks of false doctrine. It speaks of sin in the Bible. And so that speaks of when Christ bore our sin and was buried with it. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sin far away, said the hymn writer. And that is the feast of unleavened bread. Next is the feast of first fruits. Speaking of the resurrection of Christ when they brought in the first fruit harvest and they worshiped for it. Then comes the Feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost is also when Christ poured out his Spirit upon his church in Acts chapter 2. Then there's the Feast of Trumpets. 
Notice the Feast of Trumpets, and the trumpet is the seventh trump that the dead in Christ will rise first at the second coming of Christ. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. In other words, when Christ comes, the angel will blow the trumpet, and that is the seventh trumpet. So it speaks of Christ's second coming. And then we have the Feast of Atonement, when Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth, and we return with him to rule and reign, and he's ruling and reigning, and he's ruling the nations with a rod of iron. Those of us who are atoned for our sins and washed in the blood of Christ have our new and our glorified bodies, and we rule and reign with him. And then there is the judgment called the Feast of Atonement, when Christ judges all at the great white throne judgment seat that you find in Revelation chapter 20. And when you go into Revelation chapter 20, behold, I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them, says the Bible. And those who were not written in the book of life were cast into the lake of fire. So is the false prophet, and so is the beast also. So we find the devil is cast in there also. That's a whole story in itself, but that's just by the way. So here is the Feast of uh, is Atonement. And lastly, we have the Feast of Tabernacles. When we go from millennial kingdom to rule and reign with Christ, we have a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And we are populating heaven. I don't know where we'll be, but what I know is that we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And the book of Revelation tells us that, the, that behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall reign with them. He'll rule with us. Oh, that we will be with him forever and ever. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So the seventh pours out his vial. Notice, into the air. That's the only of the, one of the seven vials that are poured out into the air. It's the only one. They're all on the sea. They're all on the earth. And you, you, you read through that chapter. They're, they're all they're everywhere. But this last one is poured out into the air. The air here speaks of aerial warfare that is to come. The seventh angel is not yet poured out, but it is coming. The word here for the, the voice that comes from the temple is the naos, the, the dwelling place of God. And he cries, it is done. For our fountain says it means it has come, that the final war to end all wars is then upon us. So we're told that these three unclean spirits like frogs, they're gathering the kings of the earth and of the whole world together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So in other words, we are being gathered when you read your news, see your news or you read your papers or you go online and you see nation coming against nation, things are getting worse. I mean, I am perplexity and men's hearts are failing for fear and all these things are coming upon the earth. You can understand that Christ is coming. Now notice this. Let's look at this gathering of who these nations are. Ezekiel 38, please. Ezekiel chapter 38. We're going to show you some slides, God willing. Last week we had more slides, but it was my fault. I keep going off track and they can't keep up with me. And this, the, the slides are all over the place. But most of them are on the video that we have a DVD from. Ezekiel 38. I'll have to stop and start as I go through this. And I've done this before, and I've went into detail how this was found, and you'll see maps to give you an idea. Some of the maps are a little mixed up because the nations have changed a little, but, some of them are, but this gives us a general idea. Okay, Ezekiel 38, please. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Gog, Magog, Meshach, Tubal. So where are they? Gog and Magog, Meshach and Tubal cover the whole of what was known as the USSR, the old Soviet Union. Here is a map of Gog, Magog, Magog war, especially to the red at the north, the north part there. There's a conglomerate and confederacy come. This is the whole confederacy that will initially come against the land of Israel and you'll see another confederacy coming in the war, okay? Gog means big, colossal, gigantic. 
The book of Ezekiel tells us he comes from the uttermost part of the north. And you go straight up north, this big, giant, colossal nation is that Russia. And then, of course, there are others that will come. Russia and Magog, around the steppes of Russia, right across towards the east, the more Mongolian side, around towards China. And you'll find that that's Gog, Magog. Meshach and Tubal are reportedly meant to be the ancient names of Moscow and Tobolsk today. So they'll come in this great horde. Notice what it says in verse 4, just for time's sake. And I will turn thee back and put into thy jaws, hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company of bucklers and shields, and of them handling swords. Now I see the steps of Russia. The steps of Russia are mentioned all the time in the news. And where is it? The steps of Russia is the Ukraine. And right along that southern region, we have the Ukraine. The Khazars were known to be horsemen around that area. Khazarian Empire. And by the way, Khazarians, many of them had converted to Jewry as well at one point. And some of them as were there, not true Jews also. Okay? And then we, uh, they also stretch right across the southern eastern part of Russia into what's known as the Tartars and western and up into Lithuania, some Moldovia and some in Romania. But mainly the Ukrainian area is where they are known to be horsemen from ancient times. He says there's going to be a horde coming. Look at your news tonight. Where is prevalent in your news tonight? Where is the, the war? Oh, but they've made a peace deal. They haven't had peace yet. I told you that last week. There's no chance. There's too many pipelines and gas lines come down into Crimea. And they want that from the sea there that goes right across into the Mediterranean. And they want to be able to control that. That is Britain and America want to control that. NATO want to control that. Do you know people say, oh, it takes so much to start a world war, does it? Do you know how the First World War really kicked off? What the blue touch paper for it was? The killing of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Sarajevo. One man shooting him and his wife dead was the trigger to start the First World War. One gun attack. And that's all it took. Here we see the nations are heating up. Notice also then, let's go down to verse 5. Persia. Ethiopia and Libya with them and all of them with shield and helmet. Now Persia is Iran today. Persia is actually greater than Iran. It takes in uh, parts of Iraq as well. So that area will come. Do you know that there, any of their nuclear power which allegedly is for uh, uh, fuel purposes and eco uh, economical purposes do you know most of their nuclear power, where it come from, where their technology came from? From Russia. Notice the conglomeracy. Russia, Persia will come together. There's an axis of evil also that will come. We'll show you it in a moment. So you have, you, you have uh, Iran, and also then you have, just let me read it, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is more than just Ethiopia we know now. Then Ethiopia was the whole, almost the whole northern region of North Africa was then known as Ethiopia. And of course, with that, you had Libya is mentioned here with all of, all of them with shield and helmet. Now, here's another one, Gomer. Gomer, many say, is uh, Germany or the Eastern European countries. And you can see here in a map where Rosh, Rosh is the name, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. The, the, the term chief prince uh, the actual uh, Hebrew name is Rosh, and Rosh means the head. If you go to the head of a river, it's the Rosh of a river where everything flows from and stems from the beginning of it. And that's why it says Rosh. Magog, you can see around Khazarian Empire, and Persia, and you can see uh, Put is where North Africa is that we spoke of there, Kush, and also Ethiopia is along that way with Libya. Now, notice this. It says these are northern Islamic Africa that is coming. It says, Be thou prepared, and prepare thyself, thou and all thy company that assemble unto thee, and thou shalt be a guard unto them. After many days thou shalt 
be visited. Notice, when is this to happen? In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land. When's the latter years? You're sitting in the latter years now. You're sitting in the latter years now. The latter years of this millennium age, when Christ is at the doors, you're sitting in it now. Okay, what we want to do is we want to go briefly and quickly. You can read the chapter, and the Lord talks about drawing them in. By the way, talking about the rise of the kings of the East from Revelation 16, China, did you know for the last number of years that Russia and China are doing what's known as joint military exercises uh, off the Chinese-Russian coast away to the, away to the east, and they call it the Shanghai Cooperation. And on top of that, then, they've now brought in the Stan states. We'll talk about the Stan states in a moment as well. Look at this. Gomer in verse 6, and all his bands in the house of Tagarma. Notice that. The house of Tagarma is Turkey. The house of Tagarma is the Ottoman Empire that has dried up the river Euphrates. They're trying to enter the European Union. That will be an extra 60 million Muslims in the European Union. Think about this. And they're looking for this to enter in. But they'll turn because their new president, he is an extremist, an Islamic extremist, and he himself said there's no such thing. He said this, there's no such thing as a moderate Muslim. You can look him up and he's quoted on it. There's no such thing as a, a moderate Muslim. I notice this. Go to verse 13 of Ezekiel chapter 38. These nations have come against that are asked, Art thou come to take a spoil? Verse 13 says that these nations that ask it are Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lands thereof. Sheba and Dedan is hard to, to know who they are. Many say they are Saudi Arabia. I find sometimes, it's, it, I always thought it was maybe around that area, but it is thought that when Abraham um, had lost Sarah, and Sarah had passed away, that Abraham had married a woman and had children with her called Keturah. You can read it in the scriptures, called Keturah. And it's thought that Keturah moved further eastward, maybe into even parts of India and even southern Afghanistan or eastern Afghanistan. I don't know how this is going to come about, but Sheba and Dedan, some say it's in Saudi Arabia. Some maps will tell you it's Saudi Arabia or one of the peninsula areas as well. Now, this map here, it's hard to see. Hopefully, you'll see it better whenever we get on the video. This map here shows us, and it's great. Look, Meshach and Rosh or Gomer for eastern uh, Europe. We have Ethiopia. We have Persia. And then we have Tubal. Notice that. And look away to the far side here. Over here, up where Great Britain is, it says Tushish, young lands. Britain's symbol is the British lion. Judah's symbol is the lion. Do you know when you look at British heraldry? Here's something to look at. Next time you go to the courthouses or you see Her Majesty's services, and you look at that, you'll see the lion and the unicorn, won't you? And they're rampant, they're sitting up like this. The unicorn was the symbol of the house of Israel. And the lion was the symbol of the house of Judah. These are all biblical symbols and heritage symbols that Britain has brought forth. And the lion of Great Britain has young lions. All the young lions thereof are the commonwealth nations of Great Britain. And they're going to come with the United States and say, aren't thou come to take a spoil? And there will be World War III Armageddon. World War III. Now you look at the news even tonight. Just this week, Russian bomber planes were escorted off the coast of Cornwall. They scrambled jets in Britain. Just last week, they were escorted off the northern coast of Scotland. They have intercepted a Russian submarine in the, I think it was the North Sea, just recent weeks. And when you look at what happened in eastern uh, Ukraine and around Sevastopol and all around that area, the, the Russian nationals are now rising up wanting Russia, the communist Russia, to overtake again. And if you go right to the far coast of the North Sea up into the Baltic region. Is it the Baltic Sea? 
where, where Norway and the Baltics are, I think it's around there, you'll have Estonia, Lithuania, and I think it's Latvia coming off the top of my head. And Estonia and Lithuania are no less than one quarter Russian. You haven't heard the end of it yet. So we have all of this taking place. The bankers have now said that there's going to be another crash. Germany, among all nations, are gathering in their gold to be the powerful nation. Unfortunately, our silly government sold all ours and left us near bankrupt. I notice this as we, we go on here. Turn with me to Psalm 83. So we have the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lands thereof shall say, Art thou come to take a spoil? We think of the naval fleets, rule Britannia, Britannia rule the waves. We think of the mightiest navy in the earth being the United States of America. We think of this and Tarshish actually, there's a place called Tarshish in southern Spain. That's actually near where Zaragoza is, where uh, it's believed where Zara of uh, one of Judah's children had moved to many, many years ago. And there's a trading port up and down, so that's how I got, Tarshish means smelting, and there was tin mines and there was copper all over Great Britain, and they came to dig it out. Even in Solomon's day, they came to do that. Look at this, Psalm 83. I just want to read these off, and I'll mention who they are, and you can see them maybe on a map, okay? Psalm 83. For they have, verse 5, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. This is against God. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarines. Now, do you see here the Ishmaelites? Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. They're half Semitic because of Abraham, the father of the Arab nations. Edom was from Esau, who did not want the birthright, and Jacob took the birthright. Edom then, a lot of Edomites, became Jewish as well. So are those who say they're Jews or not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There's true Jews and there's false Jews. We'll have to remember that. There's going to be whole conspiracies in the world at this time. Edom and Moab is Jordan, part of Jordan. Here's Jordan now being brought into the war. Notice this. The Hagarines, many believe it's from Hagar, who was Sarah's handmaid. Uh, some argue this, but that was, she was an Egyptian. Gibal is believed to be Jabil, the city of Jabil in Lebanon today. Amalek, many say around Sinai, Arabs around that direction. The Philistines say, there are, they say Philistines are in Gaza. Many believe the inhabitants of Tyre as well. Asher is Syria and northern Iraq. Now, notice this, Syria and Iran and the Lebanon are all an axis of the same peoples with Hezbollah fighting from them and with them. It's in Syria that this group ISIS has come. It came from what was known as the Arab Spring. Do you remember that? Whenever Libya and Egypt and Tunisia all had revolutions and it was backed by the CIA, overthrow them. It was really backed by the New World Order. It was backed by men who are, who are top bankers. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to show you. Look at this. In 2000 AD, that's 2000, year 2000, there were seven countries which did without what's known as a central-owned bank. A central-owned bank. Here's the countries. Afghanistan, Iraq, the Sudan, Libya, Cuba, North Korea, and Iran. In other words, they weren't controlled by the banking fraternity. They had their own banking, these countries. By the year 2011, only three countries are left without a central owned bank. North Korea, when you see your news, you know what's happening now. North Korea, Cuba, now Cuba has dropped their stance against the United States in the last month, and now they're allowing them to come in to start to trade with them. That's the start of that one. And the other one is Iran. And what does Britain and America want? They want to go into Iran saying it's an axis of evil. 
there are wicked men in power, wicked bankers, who like the Rothschilds, and they start these wars in order to gain so much that the elite will get richer and the poor will get poorer. And what happens is we hear about it stirs up hatred and strife in the nations and the chaos comes out of the nations then and through the chaos murder comes and bloodshed comes and nation rises against nation as Jesus said and kingdom against kingdom and there's famines and pestilences and earthquakes and all over all diverse places. And what we find is when these things happen, the bankers sit back and they rub their hands because they've funded everything on every side. High taxes come. Your freedom is done away with in order for security. And you and I become slaves to this market. And that's what's happening in the world today. You can see this map. It's 2000. It's a bit old, like, but... See that north line, almost all of that north line. Oh, that's all the Muslim world, North Africa, that will come against God's people. The children of Lot are also thought to be Lebanon. Okay, I need to close. Thank you for your attention. David Rockefeller. Has anybody ever heard of Rockefellers? You know, you'd say, who do you think you are, Rockefeller? <laughs> There's the real people, real bankers, real fraternity. And they're all in the Illuminati, the New World Order. Jesuitry inspired. I'm going to teach some night on that. The new pope is part of this. He's the first pope that's been a Jesuit. And every Jesuit has to take an oath uh, that he will become even a Protestant and preach against the Catholic Church in order to be able to bring down the Protestant people. What do you think has happened to Ulster? Hello? That's what's happened to Ulster. The Pope is bringing in everyone. I'll show it some other night and show you the, the footage of it. Muslims and, and Hindus and rabbis from, uh, from Judaism. He's bringing in people like Billy Graham. Now, you mark my words, there's photographs of it, there's quotations of it. They call it the Pentecostal or the charismatic guy. But they, he's involved in it, yep. He was at the, he was at the Vatican too. And the, oh, his name slipped my mind. Anyhow, many of the charismatic movement has now come under his wing. And he's bringing them all into this cage of every hateful and unclean bird. He's bringing them all in and they're worshipping under him and they're praying. He's kissing the Quran in the Vatican. Did you know that? There's pictures of it. He's a Jesuit and he's bringing them in to win them in order to rule them. Gullible, stupid Protestants are going and joining them. David Rockefeller says this, all we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. Let me read it again. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the new world order. In other words, what are you talking about, David? All we need is for them to have so much chaos, something has to happen, we bring in a new world order. Do you know what it really means, new world order? It means order out of chaos. That's what it means. Order out of chaos. Bring chaos to the world and there'll be a new world order. New world order means one monetary system like the euro, one monetary system, one religious system, and one government to rule over. And they're trying that even with Europe now. Notice this from Revelation 16. Thank you for your attention. Time is flowing, but stay with me. I'm going to finish this tonight because of other things I want to do. Revelation 16 and verse 19. And the great city was divided, notice, into three parts. The cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Now here comes, this is the seventh vial poured out. Revelation chapter 16, verse 20 and 21 says, And there fell upon men, a great hail out of heaven, the plague thereof was very great. Aerial warfare, the first time it's in the air, 
Now notice this, Joel chapter 2 and verse 30, the Old Testament prophet says, the Lord says, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. See the word pillars there, it's the word tamara in the Hebrew. And the word tamara gives the idea of a palm tree that goes up and spreads at the top. And Joel seen it with the spirit of prophecy. He says, wow, there's a big cloud. There's a big pillar of smoke from the, from the earth to the heavens. And it spreads like a mushroom or a palm tree at the top. And there's it there. Joel saw that. Way back in the Old Testament. Verse 31, and the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Zechariah 14 and 12, and this is the plague wherewith the Lord shall smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Here, you ever see those, uh, uh, those pictures of, 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 of Hiroshima? Uh, and, and Nagasaki, when those bombs are dropped, people standing and the flesh just falls off them. Zechariah saw it. I've got good news for you. I'm close with good news. Here's where I've identified these nations of Armageddon that we're seeing in our news today. Notice this. Zechariah 14 and 4 speaks of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, on his feet, the feet of Christ, the risen Savior, King of kings and Lord of lords. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley. And the half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half toward the south. Notice his feet shall come and stand upon the Mount of Olives. The feet whom the needy fell down at, the feet whom others cried at, the feet that Mary sat and listened at, the feet that were kissed and anointed with oil, the feet that were washed with tears, the same feet that were dried with the woman's hair, the feet that walked Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Galilee, the feet that walked upon the waves of the water. Psalm 18 and verse 9 says, He bowed the heavens also and came down in darkness, was under his feet. Listen to Psalm 22 and verse 15. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked enclose me, they pierced my hands and my feet. And they hadn't even got piercing of the feet them when David had written that. Looking at the cross of Calvary, the feet that were nailed to the tree, the feet that were pierced, the feet that were wounded, the feet that were scarred, are the feet that are coming to stand on that day on the Mount of Olives. And he's coming to take you and I to be with himself. Praise the name of Jesus. This same Jesus said the man beside him at his ascension, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall call so come in like manner out of heaven as you have seen him taken up from you into heaven. Christ is returning with power and great glory. And I'm getting excited about ourselves myself. This will not be secret. Don't you listen to that. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 7. And to you are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed. The word is apocalypsis, his appearing, his manifestation. Appeal, revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony was believed among you in that day. Now, if that is secret, then why is he coming to be admired, glorified in the saints, and admired in all those who believe? In the last scripture, we mentioned it already. I want to mention it again. First Thessalonians 4 and 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, and then we which are alive and remain 
shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When you turn on your TV station, you see Russia, and you see all the things that are happening in Europe, and you see this group called ISIS, and you see these Islamic movements, and you see them all over the place. Listen, yes, be up, and yes, be doing, and watch and pray, but don't you be afraid, because this book tells me the king is coming. <laughs> Jesus is coming, and he's coming to take his bride, and we shall reign with him forever and ever. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be his glorious and wonderful name.